Welcome back to Data Science for Everyone. I am Professor Jones-Roy, so happy you are here. In this video, I want to talk about descriptive statistics, or as I've called it in videos elsewhere, down with the tyranny of means. We too often focus on the mean as the statistic we use to compare or evaluate or track. We're always checking means, and means are great. Some of my best friends are means, but there are a lot of other things that we can focus on in our data set before we even get to comparing the relationship between X and Y and say, what's going on with X? There's a lot more that we can say than just the mean. To quote uh, a good friend of mine recently passed away, rest in peace, uh, Bear Brownmuller. He wrote a fantastic article. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong now, but it was something like why we, we overly focus on the mean stuck in a moment we can't get out of and the mean is a moment. It's hysterical. All right. So we're going to talk about lots of different descriptive statistics, and then we will dive in in later statistics videos into actually saying things like, does X predict Y? But for now, we've just got our X. So the first one I want to focus on is measures of frequency. This can be very basic, but we often forget about it. I've picked here an example that's riveting, and uh, I know all of you were like, what are the horse coat colors? Suppose we have a data set of horses, which we will have a data set of horses that we'll get to in a future video, so get excited for that. Uh, we could say, how often does something occur, right? We could just count something. How often are horses bay colored or chestnut colored? How often are there wars? How many people got infected? And so on. How many respondents in my survey are from Canada? A lot of times we just skip over this. It's so basic, but we skip over it, and that can be a perfectly good observational start to our data and could motivate further questions. Why are all of our respondents from Canada when we actually sampled all of North America or whatever? Of course, we also have percentages, so the proportion of time that something happens. What percentage of respondents are from Canada? What percentage of horses are color bay? And do we include dark bay and blood bay in those colors? Beautiful. Majestic creatures. All right. So generally, with measures of frequency, we are wondering how often or with what frequency does something happen that we're interested in? How often does someone score a five in their performance evaluation? How often do people indicate that they are very satisfied with their work at our company? A lot of my work is in people analytics, and so I have a lot of examples from that when I'm not talking about horses. Frequency distributions are a little bit more interesting. This is a visualization of how often particular values appear in a variable. Distributions are your new best friend. If you're not using distributions to understand the world, get involved. So we're going to call this distributions of a variable. We're going to talk more about this in the future. And we can plot distributions of all kinds of things. So this is a fascinating distribution of vehicles by origin and type. Okay, most cars are sedans. Great. You know, you're welcome for these riveting examples. And we can map something like the scores that students get on a test. So distributions are going to be a backbone of a lot of the work that we do. So the more comfortable we can get looking at distributions, how many people, how many subjects in our study received what types of scores, had what type of origin, and so on. Next, Measures of central tendency. If you ever took a math class, you probably know these ones. We have our mean, median, and our mode. We won't belabor this point, but the mean is the one that we do see most often. The sum of the observations divided by the number of observations. Generally, when we hear the word average, that's what we think of. But don't discount the median. I love a good median. This is the value that splits our distribution in half. A median can be much more useful for variables that are distributed in ways that most observations have a few and some have a lot. So we want a median if we look at things like house prices, income, because the mean is going to be really, really high because a few people have tons of money and the rest of us are hanging out. A median is actually going to give us a closer picture at what the average person is doing. And there's the mode, which you're not going to see a ton in data science, but I'd be remiss if I left it out. It's discrete variables, so something that could just take on the value, say, of a survey result, one, two, three, four, five. The most common result was four. That's informative in a way that something continuous like the temperature of the air, maybe the mode isn't that interesting. All of these are statistical averages. Generally, it tells us what's the most common, but common in three different ways. So just a reminder that when you're making your means, think about the other options that you have. In addition, putting the pieces from our distribution and our central tendency together, the values of the mean, median, and mode relative to one another can give us clues about the distribution. So a normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution or a bell curve, you'll hear it used. I prefer Gaussian or normal. Bell curve is not quite precise enough for my taste. But if the mean and the mode and the median are all the same, we're working with a normal distribution. Most observations are in the middle, and then we have a few that are very high and very low. 
But not everything is normally distributed. In fact, many things are not normally distributed. If we have a distribution that's a left skew, we have a mean that's higher than the median, which is higher than the mode. And if we have a right skew, the mode is higher than the median is higher than the mean. You don't have to commit this to memory, but just know that looking at the distribution in addition to the mean, median, and mode are already fantastic ways to get a much fuller picture of whatever it is that you're studying. Again, even before we get to predictions or explanations or anything else. This is just our exploratory data analysis, our observational stage. Let's get a little bit more interesting. Measures of dispersion. This is the area that I wish was was de rigueur. Is that how you say that? Was, was default. I wish from now on, I'm going to regret this wish. Anytime someone reports a mean, they also report a measure of dispersion. Specifically, I'm thinking of a standard deviation. So a measure of dispersion is how spread out our data is the spread outness, to use a technical term, of values in a particular variable. So we could actually talk about this in a number of ways. The simplest is the range, which I'm sure you saw in math class, the difference from the highest and lowest values in a variable. There are quartiles. I tend not to talk about quartiles. My understanding is people in finance like to talk about quartiles. Is that true? I don't know. Come yell at me. Where we divide the upper and lower half. So we find the median and then we find the median of that. And then we can talk about what's in those quartiles as a way of talking about how spread out the data is. Specifically, you'll see an interquartile range. So quartile three to one. So cut the top and the bottom. What's the range of the kind of middle half? But here are some that I'm more partial to. The variance, which is a measure of how spread out the values are overall. And more practically, what you'll see in, in everyday use, the standard deviation. This is the square root of the variance and, and much more commonly Use. So generally speaking, and we'll see these again later on, how widely individuals in a group vary with respect to a certain aspect. So there's the mean height of people, but we also on our soccer team or whatever, but we also want to know the variation. Is there a high variation, a high standard deviation, a broad range, or is it relatively narrow and everyone is roughly the same height? So a couple of examples here, because it's not the most intuitive range, right? So horse prices, we're getting to some horse data. I'm not like crazy obsessed with horses, though I did have a very lovely Briar horse collection back in the day. This is the highest value minus the lowest value. The most expensive horse minus the least expensive horse is our range. From just the range, we don't know anything about the shape of the distribution. Are most of them really expensive and one is cheap? Are most of them really cheap and one is expensive? Is it normally distributed? But it's a start. We have a sense of the scope. Horse prices range from, I think, zero to infinity. I think that's about what it is. All right. If I were more clever, there'd be a home on the range joke, but there isn't because I'm not. The IQR is a little bit more information about the distribution. Normally, we're going to talk about it in a five number summary. So we'll have the minimum, the Q1, the median, the Q3, and the max, quartile one and quartile three. There's some code in Python that we'll get to in a bit around how to find some of these things. Some examples of variance and standard deviation. Prepare to use them forever if you know what's good for you. And you do because you're watching this video. Hey, all right. The variance, as I said, is how spread out the data is from the mean. So it's the average of the squared differences from the mean. We square it so that we don't cancel out the negative values. The standard deviation is how spread out the data is from the mean in a format that we can actually interpret or more readily interpret by finding the square root of the variance. You don't need to commit this to memory for this course. Generally speaking, and again, we'll come back to this, the larger the standard deviation, the more spread out the values are. So what's an example? Who cares? I work with a lot of companies and they conduct surveys and they want to say, how happy are you to work here? Blah, blah, blah. An example question might be, how confident are you that bias was reduced in your last annual review meeting? I do a lot of work around bias reduction in performance evaluation because performance evaluation is turning something complex like performance into a number, and we hope we do it in a way that's not biased, and that's hard to do. So we could ask this question in our survey to get a sense of things, and maybe the answers are five is very confident, four is somewhat confident, and on down. Usually companies report a mean, and then they kind of stop, and that makes me sad. So the mean might be 3.5. A standard deviation of 0.9 tells us how spread out it is. The range, oh, it's from two to five. Okay, so we had no ones. That's something. And the mode was four. So most people said somewhat confident. Our last one is measures of position. Nice and simple to close us out. So this is how values fall in relation to one another. So we might be interested in the rank, right? What's the rank of a particular observation relative to others? This person is the fifth in their class. This is the third most expensive horse, a sentence I say quite a bit in my life. But 
maybe a little bit more interesting and maybe a little bit more common in some circles is percentile. So the percentage of observations equal to or lower than the value of a particular observation. So if a child is said to be in the 90th percentile for height, they are as tall or taller than 90% of children. So your question should be, what's a sample of children? Who are we working with? What's going on? But okay, right? Common in standardized test reporting as well, the applicant score is in the 88th percentile. In fact, for things like GREs and SATs, my understanding is that people on admissions care more about the percentile than the overall score because the overall score could change, you know, the mean score could change from year to year. And so the percentile tells you a bit about how they do relative to the peers who also took the test at that time. So generally, it's how high an observation's value is compared to other values in the variable. So we just talked about percentiles, and you can see where it all fits in. Alrighty, I will see you in the next video.